Good evening, I'm Yvonne Okwara Matole on this first day of the 11th month of the year 2017 and tonight there are calls for constitutional reforms towards solving the impending political stalemate that has stayed on days after two contested presidential elections. By all indications, both Jubilee and the National Super Alliance are not rooting for a coalition government. The National Council of Churches has proposed an expanded executive to accommodate the opposition. This too has attracted mixed reaction. Meanwhile, the opposition coalition is pursuing a cause that would see the formation of a so-called People's Assembly. So what next for the nation? Should we or should we not consider constitutional reforms? And why does Kenya continually find itself in such a constitutional dilemma every electioneering year? We recommend that Kenyans, through parliament, amend the constitution of Kenya 2010 to provide for A, an expansion of the executive to provide for the president to appoint a prime minister and two deputies as part of the executive of the winning party or coalition. The prime minister and deputy prime ministers will sit on the cabinet and may answer questions in parliament. These positions can be ascribed other names. We hasten to add that this is an expanded executive of the winning party or coalition. It is not a Nusumkate arrangement. We call for the restoration of the position of leader of the official opposition as was in the old constitution and the creation of the position of deputy leader of official opposition in parliament. Mom ...of one year to put together an independent, credible election management body. And so it is in the space of that one year that we are asking Kenyans to consider what their options are. And that is another sovereign decision of the Kenyan people that needs to be uh, canvassed and discussed. So we are not calling for a coalition government. We need to make that clear. At the end of the proposed national dialogue, Kenyans, as I've already said, should feel they will not be left behind in the next five years and beyond. In other words, the dialogue should be not be aimed at in distributing posts and goodies to satisfy a few individuals' selfish interests. And that is the discussion we're having tonight on constitutional reforms here on The Big Story. And we will be joined by Bishop Julius Wanyoike, who is the NCCK chairman of Nairobi region, Mule Masao, who is the national coordinator of the Election Observers Group, ELOG, and also the chairman of the Kenya Diaspora Alliance, Shem Ochodo, is also with us tonight. Ochodo is a former member of parliament for Rangwe constituency and the author of Dawn of a Rainbow, the untold intrigues of Kenya's first coalition government. But first, we want to start off with our lead reporter here on the show tonight, Sophia Wanuna, who joins me from, you know, some of the historic grounds when it came to the 2010 constitution. In fact, the historic ground for the promulgation of that, and that is uh, at the Uhuru Park. Sophia, good evening. Historic place you are reporting to us from tonight. Also, talk to us about the timeline of events of how we got to this point where we're even starting to possibly consider reforms. Good evening, Yvonne. Yes, considering reforms as a country once again. And this is not a place we have not been before. We've been here before. And why is that we keep getting around to this kind of a position as a country every electioneering period? Yvonne, that largely around a significant number of people feeling excluded, feeling that those that would represent their views do not have a seat at the table. So let me take us back in some of the events we've seen unfold in our history here in Kenya leading up to this moment. Let's have a look at 1992, for instance. Before the first multi-party elections, and this is following the repeal of Article 2A, then President Moy and his Attorney General Amos Wako drafting a bill that sought to introduce the office of Prime Minister as well as a deputy. However, that was not successful because those opposed to it argued that if the proposal was to have those people in office, the appointing power was to still be the president. 
Remember at the time, President Moy was trying uh, to answer or cure what was becoming uh, a growing opposition. And so seeing that he needed to include more voices, that effort did not uh, succeed because then it was seen to be counterproductive. Then came 2002, Yvonne, and the Ashpalgai draft. In this draft, once again, the country getting to a place where it wanted to have Office of Prime Minister, two Deputy Prime Ministers. However, the administration, the government at the time, still not very supportive of constitutional changes, and they were kicked out of office before that could see the light of day. Following that, in 2004, Yvonne, many will remember the Bombers draft, and many analysts argue that was a good draft in as far as having not only the office of prime minister uh, put in place or proposed, but that the prime minister would have executive powers as well as deputy uh, prime ministers. However, that as well. Uh, it appears at the time that those who are in op uh, President Kibaki's uh, government, his handlers, felt that in reducing his powers, that would not go well to have another parallel center of power, if you like. So in 2005, there was then a Wako Kilifi draft. And in that draft, Yvonne, what happened is that the gains, if you like, that had been made in giving powers to the office of the prime minister, those powers were whittled wilt wilt down. And you had an imperial president once again. And it is that draft, the 2005 one, that went to the referendum, unsuccessfully so. So Kenyans went back to the drawing table. And in 2010, under the Zamba Kitonga-led team, a harmonized constitutional draft was put together. And this draft was borrowing from these other drafts in the past. In this draft, Yvonne, there was also position for the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister. In essence, a hybrid system, borrowing from a parliamentary and presidential system. However, in the same year, before this could be put to a referendum, the Parliamentary Select Committee in Naivasha removed that clause, putting in place office of prime minister. And just like that, quickly thereafter, that uh, uh, draft went to a referendum, successfully so. And in 2010, the 27th of August, right here at this historic grounds, Uhuru Park, in a very colorful ceremony, that 2010 constitution was promulgated. It is important to note, Yvonne, since then we've had another election, 2013. And remember also, actually, to go back to that 2010, at the time those changes were being made in Naivasha, because all this while, Raila Denga had been a, propon a, pro a proponent of the prime minister position. However, his supporters, those who were uh, from his party in parliament, agreed with him, and he endorsed removing the prime minister position. And the feeling was at the time that in 2013 he would get into office. So he backtracked on his push for having the office of prime minister up until that time. And so, Yvonne, what we've seen again is that cycle continuing. Many people feeling they still do not uh, have representation at the very top. But with this past election, 2017, the 8th of August, before that, in their manifesto, the National Super Alliance had a setup, a lineup, a structure at their top organ where they had uh, Raila Dinga as a presidential candidate, Kalonzo as the running mate, and then there was a chief minister, and that was Musalia Mudavidi, and the deputy chief ministers uh, being Musa, uh, Wetangula as well as Ruto, who has since uh, left NASA. So again, you can see efforts to take us back, and in fact, also part of their proposals in their manifesto was to ensure their constitutional changes and reforms. So in a not so much of a nutshell, Yvonne, that is where some of what we've witnessed in our recent past, and this is where where we are in appears, these calls once again for changes and reforms are calls that cannot be ignored, Yvonne. That's right. And this election has once again brought to the fore these issues about inclusivity in the government and need to reform um, our constitution, at least according to those who are calling for talks and for dialogue towards reforming the constitution. So let's bring it back to present day now. Tell us how many groups or how many different you know, people are out there asking for reforms of the Constitution now. 
Quite a number of groups, Yvonne, have come out to publicly talk about reforms and most importantly, dialogue. You have the multi-sectoral forum and this is a group uh, that uh, has a civil society, there's a business community, you have religious entities as well, trade unions, and they are saying it is important that the country comes up with not only short-term measures but as well as long-term going into resolving the crisis or situation, if you like, Kenya finds herself in and they spoke before the 26th election uh, repeat presidential election they expected again perhaps after this in this current situation we find ourselves in as a country to once again address uh, the nation then there's a caucus of leaders uh, they're calling themselves that saying they support president Uhuru Kenyatta some of the leaders there uh, William Kabogo Kabando Kabando Martha Karua and Dongo Gezenji and they lost in the 8th of August election they have also come out to strongly call for dialogue in fact even before the 26th of October election, uh, castigating the environment in which Kenya was going to a repeat election in, saying there was important, uh, an important, uh, uh, it was important for the country to come together and to talk before going into that fresh election. But also let's listen now to the chairman of the IEBC, Wafula Chabukati, who talked about what is a conducive environment for constitutional order. In the words of Nelson Mandela, as long as poverty, injustice, and gross inequality persist in our world, none of us can truly rest. Our constitution is as good as the environment in which it operates. We cannot fix the politics of this nation if we do not fix the economics. The economics. So you've heard from the chair there, the NCCK, as we heard earlier, even yesterday, talking about an expanded executive. You have as well ELOG, Observer Group, also uh, calling for dialogue. The international community as well has in the past couple of weeks as well called uh, for dialogue. Yvonne, let's finally also listen uh, to what now the political players. You have Norman Magaya, who's CEO, uh, the NASA Secretariat, talking about what kind of engagement and action they seek to take going forward in light of that statement from Raila Odinga, in light of the People's uh, Assembly and also what Eden Duale had to say in respect to the same. Our intention is to have the biggest People's Assembly ever witnessed in this country mm -hmm. and that's why all mobilization is being put into it so that a resolution and a decision taken in that assembly will have the full force uh, of the power of the people. What is the end result? when you form these people's assembly, what do you gain? I mean, in the National Assembly, the Senate, the Count Assemblies, their deliberations are anchored in the Constitution, and there's a product that comes out of those assemblies. If it is a budget, they are the budget-making organs of the legislature. If it's about laws, the laws that they pass becomes law upon assent by the president, you know, and can be used by the judiciary in the implementation of uh, the, judi the, the judicial system in the country. So I don't see the rationale for the People's Assembly. So, Yvonne, we heard from the president when he was uh, handed over his uh, election, re-election certificate, saying that in as far as dialogue is concerned, this dialogue uh, several quarters are calling for, that can only happen once he's properly in office, if we do get to that point, that at this particular time he's waiting uh, to see if, in fact, there will be legal recourse sought by those that are disgruntled and disputing uh, his re-election. Raila Odinga saying he wants dialogue, he's calling for national dialogue dialogue and we'll wait to see how all of these calls and statements will pan out in coming days. Yvonne. Thank you very much for that. Sophia Wanuna, our lead reporter here on the big story from Uhuru Park grounds from where we promulgated this constitution on the 27th of August 2010. So let's talk about that now a little bit more. Let me remind you once more of my guest tonight, Bishop Julius Wanyoike from the Anglican Church of Kenya, Mule Musau from the Election Observers Group, and Dr. Shem Ochodo, who's the chair of the Kenya Diaspora Alliance. Gentlemen, good evening and thank you. I want to start with you, Bishop, because you're the one who's, uh, you know, from your group, we've seen the more elaborate uh, statement of what it is that you hope to see in um, the reform process. So let me ask you this. 
Why do you believe that the creation of a prime minister position and official leader of opposition will solve some of the problems that we are having with our electoral process, with our constitution today? Uh, thank you very much, Yvonne. Uh, I think the challenge you have in the country, uh, thank you very much, Yvonne. I think the problem we have in the country is the feeling and thoughts of exclusion in which case those who lose within the political offices that they are looking for seem that they have been denied an opportunity which within democracy is right and at the same time within a multi-ethnic community it is important for us to reflect on what it means for those who are following such a people who have lost in such positions. And our thinking as NCCK is how can the elected president form coalition that is cushioned within his governance, all her governance at that time that we shall have a female president, so that those who may not have had an opportunity for political office because of the numbers, will find themselves included within the leadership of this country. And our statement yesterday was to the effect that let the elected president form a coalition with those who would desire to partner with him and at the same time recognize the official position of an opposition leader in parliament. And this is a debate that we are seeking that the country may continue to discuss around the proposal. And this does not mean that as NCCK we are right, but we are only providing an agenda setting in which case we, we can think on how those who feel excluded in the political office can be able to find a place to contribute in the leadership and gov governance of this country. All right, thanks for that, Bishop. So you're saying it's an offer on the table, may not be the right one, Thank but you. something that we can start to yes. think about and talk about. So let me hear from you, uh, Dr. Ochoa, what your thoughts are on this. You have been, you've written a book on the untold intrigues of Kenya's first coalition government. Is it that simple? We've been here before, haven't we? Uh, hi, Yvonne. Allow me before I say any words to deliver condolence to the bereaved uh, family, friends, and relatives, and clock of uh, Bishop Korir. He passed on at a time uh, that the night before he passed on, actually, Honorable Kipruto Kiru and I, late into the night, were part of a group trying to look into a conversation and uh, identify some leaders, religious leaders that uh, could uh, help assist fast track the need for a national dialogue and Bishop Silas Diego, Bishop Korir, both their names came up. So may the good Lord rest his soul in peace. Uh, in secondly, I would say, Yvonne, I think Kenya diaspora were perhaps the first to call for national dialogue. One of the major local newspapers carried it on the 5th of October. So we're glad that thereafter there's been this talk and chorus of national dialogue because we think it's the right way to go. Uh, as Kenya Diaspora Alliance, we do embrace, we think this country belongs to all of us and we need to converse about it. Uh, talking about um, positions is one thing, uh, but uh, perhaps we need to address more deeper issues, issues of uh, exclusion, issues of historical injustices. But uh, if offices is one way to address it, we're happy to converse and uh, we appreciate the proposition that NCCK has put forward, like other groups have and we are also keen to put forward our proposition. Over to you, Yvonne. All right, we'll get to what your proposition is in a minute. Let me listen to Mule Musau. So, uh, Shem says it's, it's about more than positions, but surely having persons who are in government and it's more inclusive will ensure that uh, there's perhaps better distribution of resources. You're also calling for dialogue. What do you want us to talk about, Mule? Well, thank you very much, uh, Yvonne, and I'm happy that uh, this uh, discussion on uh, having a di dialogue uh, is gaining traction in all quarters. Uh, I think uh, 
the reason why uh, an election observation group is calling for dialogue um, uh, is because one of the things that we are now finding ourselves in, this is the fourth election where there have been a, a, a kind of a, a dispute. Uh, from 2007, uh, 2013, we had the first election on the 8th of August. We have this election which just happened the other day on the 26th. And emerging from those elections is a feeling that there's a group which is feeling ex excluded, uh, uh, there is a feeling that uh, the election is not solving the political question in the country in terms of how Kenyans can be able to live together. And that's the reason why we're saying perhaps we need to go beyond election. And, and uh, election gives you government. But if you're going to have a government, as we have seen, like in those four elections, uh, Kenyans have been split nearly right in the middle. Uh, you are having people on one side of the divide um, uh, who come again to vote another next time, hoping that they're going to be in included in, this, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the process. And because of the kind of system that we also have in terms of the election itself, which we have been calling is a zero-sum game, where the one person who wins takes everything, the one who loses loses everything. Therefore, it becomes a political question. And that's the reason why we are saying, as observers, why can this go beyond election? Why not have national dialogue that seeks to address that political question? How do we include everybody? Do we need to change? Are there structural changes that perhaps we need to have? And there are those, of course, now who are calling for the constitutional changes and others. But it's a question of a political question and a political settlement of a, of a matter which has emerged over the last four elections. Mole, is it really about the constitution that we need to change? A lot of people say this, it has been said, this is the most progressive constitution in the world. Is our problem the constitution or is our problem our failure to adhere to it? I think there are very many uh, questions on this. And, and I, I, first, I want to agree with you that uh, we need to adhere to the constitution. Uh, one of the issues, again, we have been picking up is that we have very little faith in, um, uh, in the constitution yet. Uh, everybody argues it's one of the most progressive. But like uh, Wanuna has explained in terms of uh, the chronology of, of, of issues uh, all through, uh, one of the, of, of the big issues which was being discussed in the initial discussions on the constitution, constitution was to discuss whether how to devolve power from the center and how to involve as many people as possible. I think the issue the Naivasha uh, uh, Accord uh, or the Naivasha Retreat where uh, some of the gains on the main, uh, on the constitution, like the parliamentary system, uh, were retreated on, uh, were among what, what people are calling the 20% or so of things which should be fixed. Now it, become, it, it seems that to have become apparent from uh, the la just one election, and, and again I will agree with those people who say that I think it's too early to be able to change the constitution, but when it becomes very apparent to the level that we are polarized as a country, then the need for us to ask ourselves what are the changes which are required. Is it a question about respecting institutions or restructuring and reforming the institutions or is the constitution? It's a question, is that a dialogue that we need to have so that we find exactly where the problem is? So that Mule Musao, Dr. Shemo Choda and Bishop Julius Wanyoike, we want to continue with this conversation after this short break. When we return, we'll talk about which changes particularly we want to see in the constitution. Is it all about sharing out positions between the ruling party or the winning, the majority and the minority? We have that and much more right here on The Big Story. Plus, the feedback as well.